People's Platform. Good evening and welcome to the People's Platform. What shocks our collective consciousness? We have become so desensitized to the horrors of the world, footage of war zones we peruse on our phones while sipping on our tea, child rapes, stabbings, shootings. We watch these news stories and say, what has come of this world? And we switch off our TVs keep aside our devices and move on. We have become so used to injustice becoming normalized, as long as we are not the ones at the brunt of it. In a backdrop where collective action is crucial, how must we go about reviving social consciousness in order to bring forth a society that is just and equitable? Let's have the conversation. My guest tonight is a former Mrs. Sri Lanka, one of the founders of Women in Need, a sportswoman and a women and child rights advocate. Carol Tozer, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sonali, for having me. Absolutely. To begin the conversation on reviving social consciousness, what do you believe are the root causes behind the decline in social consciousness among the people of Sri Lanka, especially uh, in the context of maladministration and political frustrations? So, Sonali, when we talk about social consciousness, it's usually triggered by empathy for others. Uh, it's also about caring for those who are marginalized and underprivileged. Uh, it's also talking about uh, the needs of other people put before your own. Mm -hmm. And I really think in our society, somehow over the years, people have been frustrated with how things work. Uh, they have been upset that their lives have not been improved. And so everybody is fighting for a place within themselves, how they can improve their lot. Mm -hmm. And they forget about everybody, the other people who are also affected. I think the root cause of some of this, not all of it, mm -hmm. is I think um, political mismanagement, uh, how politicians actually f take, for instance, democracy. Democracy is supposed to be uh, a separation of uh, the legislature and the executive and unfortunately I think there are very blurred lines, blurred lines between what is truth and what is not untrue. And uh, someone told me that when a politician is elected to power, the first thing that they do is think about how to stay in power rather than how they are going to uplift uh, the lives of the people. And so we have uh, frustration building up amongst the people that their voices are not heard and politicians are only elected by them and they are given various incentives to vote for certain people. So we are also party to this uh, mismanagement if you will mm. because we are electing people who are totally unsuited to the position of the office that they are elected. Power corrupts absolute, power corrupts absolutely. We find that in today's context, there is a great deal of hatred that the citizens have against um, those in office, uh, which is not supposed to be the case. Right. Um, those who are elected as people's representatives are meant to act in the best interest of the people. And there are, uh, th there are procedures, uh, protocols governing this. Right. So where have we gone wrong? So, you know, when, when you talk about the legislature, their duty is to set laws. Mm. And I find some of this is my opinion that so, some of the laws that are set is to ensure that their longevity is protected. There is longevity in power. Mm. As you said, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, they forget that the needs of the people have to be met. Uh, social programs should be brought forth that help uh, a just and equal society for all. Now, in reality, does that work even worldwide? Mm. Maybe not, but we can only think, they say, uh, think globally, but work locally. So I think politicians have to pay extra attention as to what has soured the people. Why are they so upset? Why, why are people, for instance, the Aragalia came forward. So I believe initially the Aragalia was a very organic movement that uh, people like us, everybody, stepped out because they believed that the politicians were serving themselves rather than the people. Mm. 
maybe subsequently, you know, various people are trying to take ownership of the regalia. But to the average person, you know, they didn't come in trains and buses and walked miles and miles to serve any, any master. They came because it was uh, the need of the hour to see a change because things were going from bad to worse. We are also responsible for having kept quiet so many years. But you know, when you keep quiet, you build up and you build up and then one point, at one point you actually burst, right? Mm. So you, that, I think that was the moment of the Aragalia, that people had kept quiet so long, being pushed to the extremes. They were told by politicians and various people that, you know, times are going to get better. Uh, we had 30 years of war. Were those problems that created that war in the first place addressed? Mm -hmm. I think not. Were they disappeared, whether it was in the north or the south, uh, did they have redress, the families? I don't think so. And uh, so all, all this just builds to the fore. And I think a lot of the time, uh, racial and religious disharmony was created to engage the people, the masses, in something apart from what was actually going down. Hmm. There's something called the boiling frog phenomenon. Exactly. And I think we're a party to it. Yeah, we are party to it. Uh, politicians who kept quiet. See, I don't think anybody in the political sphere is exempt from blame. Hmm. Uh, same as some of us, you know, those who have a voice, who, who could speak. Uh, did we object at the time? Yes, we stepped out and objected because we saw so many injustices being meted out and the brunt of it was the peep, they was taken by the people. Mm. So we are also party to it. Did we sh not shout loud enough? You know, we couldn't get 50 people to come out and speak. You know, it was the same 50 people speaking on behalf of women's rights on, you know, various issues, child rights, whether it was the destruction of the environment. You know, so we are all party to it. And I think even the majority of, majority of politicians in, in, the, in the parliament were also responsible. Maybe they didn't do some of this, but by their very silence, they were also responsible. Mm. So we are complicit by our own silence and ignorance. Um, let's also talk about um, the genesis of the Aragalea. We spoke briefly about it. For us to intervene in the Aragalea, for the uh, Colombo uh, crowd to intervene in the Aragalea, uh, it had to come to a point where we ourselves were personally affected. And those in the north and east had been protesting for years and years and nobody noticed, nobody took notice. It was only when our lives, our livelihoods were being affected. affected that we actually got onto the streets, Correct. which shows the absolute hypocrisy of it, yeah. the self-centered nature Correct. of it. So that is the self, that's the social consciousness I'm talking about, mm. right? Um, people were crying for years. People's lives were affected for years. Mm. Uh, were there voices? Yes. I think uh, there were individuals and uh, groups that they call non, you know, CSO projects, sure. right? Who actually went out there to help the people. For instance, if you take a uh, uh, plant, you know, it's a, it's a uh, shoot off of the WNPS, the Wildlife and Nature Protection Society okay. that okay. set up a trust to try and uh, buy back pieces of land to protect for the future, to put it in a trust to protect for the future. Right. Uh, there's Shanti Margam who set up a, a center to help uh, children from underprivileged backgrounds and a suicide hotline with mental health. Sure. Uh, then there's, uh, these are ones that I know of, you know, there's certainly Be The Change Sri Lanka who started food security program and they started this nearly two and a half years ago. So they saw these food shortages and food issues coming. So they had empathy for other people. So they started this program where the kids in schools were given the wherewithal to actually grow. So they could free, have maybe one free, free meal a day in the school. Right. So there are, there are and there were organizations like that who came up and served because they had empathy for others, their, their humanitarian work. And those who couldn't step out themselves, you know, they could donate to these causes. Sure. So they didn't wait for these politicians who are muddling along, literally. Uh, <laughs> sorry to be so frank, but um, 
uh, they didn't wait for them. Mm. They said, we are going to be the change. And, and I think it, it's in each one of us to be the change that we are seeking. Each one of us has the power within ourselves to do something to make somebody else's life better. Absolutely. We are in conversation with Carol Tozer. We're going for a break. We'll be right back. People's Platform. President seeks to enhance Indo-Sri Lankan trade relations for mutual benefit. Adani delegation meets Minister Kanchana. Leading monks dismayed over attempts to sell national assets. Sri Lanka Air Force headquarters buildings officially given to the Sri Lanka police. Anura responds to Basil's claims saying the government is led by SLPP. Gummadda brings lasting solutions to the drinking water issue in remote Mihintale. platform welcome back you're watching the people's platform I'm in conversation with rights activist Carol Tozer um, Carol what role do you think grassroots organizations and community leaders can play in fostering social consciousness in mobilizing people towards positive change so I think you know we people went through this uh, period of apathy and frustration um, apathy in a lot of ways uh, sometimes it helps helped us right because whatever the politicians or the world threw at us we took it in our stride when the tsunami happened people survived they got over that period however hard it was you know some of them had to actually earn a living so they had to get back to work and do what they had to do but that's also something that we are while I believe is something which is a strong point in Sri Lanka is that we can deal with a lot of the stuff that's been thrown our way. That's also what we are in a way cursed with because we take it in our stride. Yeah. And that is what has brought us to this moment. And I think with technology, I mean, kids programs, for instance, uh, to answer firstly what you asked about what the grassroots levels, I think we have to go back to the drawing board. We have to create a hope and that is done with also unifying the people. I think when we have unity amongst ourselves, we can achieve that much more. I think uni disunity serves other, you know, others who have their own agendas. Sure. But if for us to get together, I think grassroots levels, uh, we have to also communicate to the people that when you vote, Please vote for somebody within your community even who does a job of work, who has been doing a job of work with no rewards expected or wanted. Uh, I think we have made a big mistake in the past voting on party lines. So we have to get this message to the people saying, please uh, don't vote for two buckets, two roofing sheets that you are given or even a cell phone. You know, you take whatever is given to you if you want to. But please vote for somebody who is going to make your life better because you are also responsible to be the change. Mm. Be party to the change. You know, don't give bribes. You know, when you expect a job of work, expect them to serve you. I mean, politicians are elected to serve you. But we the people also must serve ourselves. We can't always wait for somebody else to give us a handout. So I think grassroots level, we need to take this message across saying, in the future, build hope in the people. Mm -hmm. Build the possibility that we can be the change and a catalyst for change that will have a better tomorrow. I mean, we have to believe that. That's why even as rights activists, we continue what we do because we believe in hope right. because if you don't believe in it you have to step aside and not do anything sure, right? absolutely. so uh, going to children perhaps mm -hmm. uh, I think we have to bring in community service for every child who wants requires a school leaving certificate 
whether it's 20 hours of community service or 25 hours at community service, children should be taught community service and social consciousness. Uh, yeah. With all that we are teaching kids in school, all the homework, the tuition, that's not helping because each child is becoming quite selfish today. Yeah. And with technology and phones and iPads and iPhones and whatever it is you want and television, you're not programmed to think anymore. Yeah. Everything is fed to the kid. So we have to bring this where the kids do community service, whether they go to the hospitals and do some service or they, they go to the prisons and do some service or simply start a stop the litter campaign. I mean, there are so many ideas, right? You look around Sri Lanka covered in litter. Where is your, where is your social consciousness? Mm. How could you throw some scraps on I've seen and somebody said to me well it's the underprivileged I said no I've seen people throwing things at our buses and cars yeah. you know fancy cars so we have to create this social consciousness in our children Absolutely. and hope that things will improve for the for, for tomorrow you know in order to create this attitudinal shift societally this requires um, education we need to equip ourselves with the education to know that we are just um, a, a part of a much larger ecosystem with the trees and the birds and the rivers that we are just one small part of all of this and that we live with um, this larger ecosystem how must this education be streamlined so between you and I I think we are kids are spoon fed lots of irrelevant information right mm -hmm. uh, we also have to change with the times i think the ed education system must also be changed children must be made to participate in social events um, back in the day you know kids went to the underprivileged homes you know uh, and actually addressed wounds of the elderly swept their houses you know those are things that kids did how how could we have gone so far away from what was right mm -hmm. and become such a selfish society yeah and i think parents also now work they have to work twice as hard to earn a living yeah. and i understand that they have to do this to ensure that their kids are fed and food is put on the table however i think parents need to spend more time with their children mm -hmm. um, talking about social issues and social norms uh, we have to use all the tools that are at our disposal, whether it's interactive uh, drama, whether it's, uh, you know, we need to take this message across yeah. to, to, the, to yeah. uh, the kids and also the wider audience. Uh, create spaces where we can have uh, dialogue. Uh, I'm as guilty as, you know, looking at those memes and having a laugh occasionally or, or getting angry about something and tweeting out. I think I also have to learn, We, as I said to you, we are all party to this change if we yeah. want to see the change. Mm -hmm. So we have to use every tool that is at our disposal to make a huge paradigm shift in how we operate. You know, be a kinder society. Yeah. So arts, culture and media can be used as Absolutely. powerful tools. Absolutely. And also in schools, as I said, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the environment, look, it's the very lifeblood of our existence, mm -hmm. the environment. Yeah. Why are we so ready to destroy it? You know, we don't need to be taught empathy, but if, if people, parents talk to their children about it, being empathetic towards those who are in need or whether it's the animals who are suffering or whether the environment or like you said, the rivers and the streams, we don't throw our litter all over and walk away, right? Because mm -hmm. it all bounces up the rivers and the streams and it comes back on us in the, uh, in the long run whether the animals are eating this garbage on the way, you know, so all these are part of a larger picture of social consciousness. We don't have to say, okay, I'm going to be socially conscious and do X. There's so many areas that we can uh, contribute in. Absolutely. Um, another aspect that I'd like your perspectives on is um, the apathy and cynicism that some of us as Sri Lankans have. Um, sometimes we hear people say things like, oh, I don't vote because it doesn't affect me. Whoever is appointed, I, it doesn't affect my life. And that is such a privileged stance to take. And it's um, also rather unfair collectively speaking. How do you view that? So I've heard this 
I've heard had people say to me, I'm not going to vote. Yeah. Uh, but that's the only free will we have, literally. You know, there are laws and things that govern the rest, right? Or So the only thing we can say is we can vote. That's the only choice I have with, to vote for one or the other. Right? Uh, as you said, you know, it's, you have to be privileged to say, hey, I'm not going to vote. Because actually that vote counts for those in power, I believe, if you don't vote. It, you know, so it, your not voting doesn't do any world of good for anybody. I think that is where, again, social consciousness matters. Because if you had a conscience, you wouldn't say that. Mm. Uh, you wouldn't say, I'm not going to vote and let whatever happens, happens. Because as you said, the privileged can afford to live. Mm. But it's those that are marginalized and, you know, uh, underprivileged that have to ensure that they bring in the right people. We have to give them a lead. I mean, those of us in Colombo, you know, voting matters. Mm -hmm. And um, empathy for others matter. Humanitarian work matters. And if you don't have the time to give, you can always donate to a cause. Yeah. And ensure we actually leave a better society than we found. At the moment, what, what is happening is societal norms are dictating to us. We should be setting the societal norms and those of us here in Colombo need to actually wake up mm. and say, listen, I'm going to leave a better tomorrow. Each of us uh, can play a significant part. Um, uh, speak to us about the story of how you founded Women in Need because this is fascinating. So, yeah, so um, I entered this competition at the uh, push of my family my sister and uh, I didn't think I was any any beauty as such but I believed in myself to do whatever I wanted to do and uh, so I was told you know if you are ever asked a question please don't talk about abuse of women because at that point I was telling everybody you know we need to set up a center to help abuse women and so guess what when I was asked that's the first first thing I said but somebody read that uh, and read what I had said and reached out to me and said, listen, if you're serious, I'll find the funding to start a center to help abuse women. Now, I'm not involved with women in need anymore because I've moved on to other things, but I still think it's my baby and I, you know, I believe in it. And 30 years later, here we are with a center to help abuse women. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, you know, it's in the power of each one of us to make a difference if we dream. You know, if we believe. Um, so, yeah, th that's the start of Women in Need. And uh, a friend reached out to me and said, hey, you started Women in Need. Can I start? Can you tell me how you got about it? And there comes Shanti Margam. Yeah, Kamani Jinadasa. Kamani Jinadasa. Mm. So, you know, it's amazing how each little thing that you do can affect a larger population. Yeah. Right? So, Absolutely. Um, let's also bring in the policymakers. They are a key stakeholder in ensuring that the citizens have a better life. Um, how must the policymakers um, be conscious of creating this paradigm shift? So when you talk about policymakers, there are the, uh, the, there's the legislature. So at the moment, what they have been doing is serving one master or two masters or whatever. Some of them don't even understand the issue at hand. And we saw this overseas as well, uh, you know, with Obamacare. Those people are uneducated to deal with an issue. I find a bigger problem dealing with those who are educated, who know what is right and wrong and still choose to do the wrong thing. You know, this is a lack of conscience. Mm. This is serving one master rather than the people as a whole. So I think policymakers need to say enough is enough. It is not for us to protect politicians or anybody who wants to stay in power. It is for us to do something that our families are going to be proud of. The country is going to be proud of. So set policy that serves the people. Uh, and if you actually lead a country or lead a department and you're doing really well, you have something to be proud of rather than leave something that is broken down. So I think policymakers have to set things that are, um, you know, socially effective to help raise the standard of living of everybody and serve laws and set laws and, um, and uh, policies that are for the good of all, not just a few. Mm -hmm. 
My final question to you, um, these efforts to revive social consciousness must be inclusive and also representative of the diverse perspectives and experiences of all of the Sri Lankan peoples. So, you know, we are 52% women in this country. Uh, during the COVID lockdown, we did a program on Zoom called Women uh, Wisdom Women Sri Lanka. Five women and a big kuni got together and we talked about these real issues in every show and people had nothing to do at home. So they sat and watched all of this, right? But we talked about different areas of what affects us. Yeah how men deal with situations, how women uh, deal with the same situation, but with a different angle. You know, we need to bring more women into the picture yes. because we also uh, bring in more ideas, different types of ideas mm -hmm. into the picture. And then uh, we spread the, you know, the, set these people to go out into the uh, rural areas and take this message across, you know, like, Kanta Samitias or, you know, and what can they do? Not just a place for women to just hang out, but actually what they can do to uplift their areas, their, their village, for instance, right? And the men can do the same thing. This is not only for the women. So I think we need to get participation from everybody. It's not about, uh, I think uh, Sri Lankans have a bit of the servile mentality. Okay. If you will. Um, they like to say yes and bow down to people. Yeah. And, and what is that? You know, we need to change that and say, hey, I'm also a person in my own right. Yeah. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to bring a family forth and teach my children to be better than I am. That's what we strived. You know, whatever I struggled with, I didn't want my children to have that. I wanted them to be, do better than me. Mm. And uh, everybody I came into contact with, I, I always said to them, you know, taking English out of out of uh, the, the, the curriculum and, uh, you know, making this link language that we had was a positive. We took it out, mm. you know, because we could be unified with that language. Whatever language we spoke, we could be unified having that. So simple things like that, I think we have to revisit. And if policymakers are serious, if politicians are serious to make a change, let's bring forth a country that is developing and good for everybody, serves everybody, everybody's interest, not just for a few. So I have hope that we can do this, but we need to have more people getting energized and getting conscious and having empathy and doing some humanitarian work or donating or whichever way you can contribute to change society and make it a better place for all of us, I really think you should engage then. So the other thing is I think uh, it served politicians to divide people by race or religion. I really think we as a people need to be smarter. We need to smarten up because this serves nobody. Um, growing up, I remember, you know, we celebrated each other's differences. Where did we lose it? I, I, uh, it was consciously done, trust me. Uh, it was consciously done because you can distract the people by bringing some bogus, um, uh, what do you call it, ghost or ghostly yeah. figure into the mix and say, you worry about that while I get on with what I have to do to protect myself and my family. So uh, all that needs to change and people need to be engaged and be smarter. Carol Toza, thank you very much for sharing your perspectives. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Sonali. Thank you for having me and hope we make a change somehow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for watching us. We'll